Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Saturday recap of our chronological reading through the Reese Chronological Bible that we put together with the scriptures coming from the New King James translation, if you have our reading material. And uh, we are now at the 11th day of June in 2022. We finished week number 23. And the time frame that we have read about this past week has been from approximately 831 B.C. to 764 B.C. Normally we use the year of 722 B.C. for the year that we remember northern Israel going into captivity to Assyria. And then over 100 years after that, around 605 B.C. is when southern Judah will end up being sieged and go into captivity to the Babylonians. So there's a little over 100 years difference between when those two portions of the divided kingdom of Israel go into captivity. <clears throat> and uh, we're approaching the captivity date for northern Israel. So currently in our reading, we're still reading a little bit about scriptures that Reese assigns to information relating to northern Israel and then scriptures that he puts in the column uh, of southern Judah. So we also have read through a portion of the Old Testament this week where it's talking about the kings of northern Israel and the kings of southern Judah. And interestingly, they have either the same or almost the same names at almost the same times, and so it gets a little bit of a difficulty there when we are reading to try to remember whether we're talking about northern Israel or southern Judah. And in the original Reese Chronological Bible that I've showed you before, <clears throat> uh, the one that I have as a hardback copy, he divides the two columns during the divided kingdom and in one column on the left, he will have for the northern kingdom of Israel. And on the right, I think it's on the right, he has scriptures relating to the southern kingdom of Judah. I don't uh, have the expertise to do that in my uh, recording and, and uh, pasting these things in my computer. And I, I'm sure you could do that, but I don't have the expertise for it. So I just put... If we're talking about northern Israel, I will, in my reading material, put Israel in capital bold letters. Then when it switches to a, uh, uh, a column that would deal with southern Judah, I put Judah in bold, all capital letters. Well, as we begin our reading in northern Israel, this man that was named Jehu dies. Remember, Jehu was the one that had been anointed to be the king over northern Israel. And God instructed him that he was to strike down and to destroy all the house of Ahab. Ahab was the wicked king who had been married to Jezebel. And she brought about idolatry in northern Israel. And uh, so it was a bad situation. In fact, remember that we've made comments several times that all of the kings that we read about from northern Israel are described as bad kings or wicked or evil kings. And there are times, however, when they will show repentance and uh, ask for God's mercy, and God will grant that. And it is an object lesson to us that repentance is a good thing, even from people who we would think of as not being believers. Well, we began the week reading that Jehu died. He had been promised because he had fulfilled what God instructed him to do in destroying the house of Ahab. He had been promised then that there would be four generations of his descendants that would sit upon the throne in northern Israel. Remember that in southern Judah, all of the kings come from the line of David, so they would be in succession from the same family tree, so to speak because the promise of the Abrahamic covenant and then the Davidic covenant was that the eventually the Messiah would come as a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. 
when the nation of Israel uh, separated, had the division uh, similar to a civil war, although it didn't get to that point. Uh, those kings in northern Israel were not all of the same family tree. And if you have our reading material, the, occasionally I will make a list of uh, the kings that succeeded one another. And whenever there would be a change in family line or a change in, if it would be in other countries like Egypt, for example, we might say a change in the dynasty. I put a, a dotted line between the names where there would be a change. So Jehu died, the king of northern Israel, and we see that he has a son that's going to reign, which will be the first of four generations of his descendants that sit on the throne of northern Israel. And his name was Jehoahaz. And sometimes he's referred to Joash. And the odd and difficult thing is that about this same time, give or take a few years, there is a king in southern Judah by the name of Joash as well. So uh, we see that this son of his, Jehoahaz reigned in his place, and he also was described as being a bad king. And God allowed the, uh, the Syrians to oppress northern Israel. And then Jehoahaz is one of these examples that he pleaded with God and had a repentant heart. And God gave them some amount of relief, but they continued in the ways of Jeroboam. The scripture said Jeroboam, we'll discover this week, in our reading that there were two Jeroboams that were kings over northern Israel. Uh, they were not related. They were from separate families. The first one we normally read is Jeroboam the first, and the second one that we read about this week is normally referred to as Jeroboam the second. So this bad king Jehoahaz, uh, even though he sought God's mercy and God gave him some amount of relief, it says that he continued in the ways of Jeroboam, that first uh, bad king of northern Israel. Then back down in southern Judah, there was this uh, young man named Joash that had been made king. His grandmother's name was Athaliah, and she was for a while the queen, and she had taken over the leadership of the country when her son had been killed in battle, and she wanted to rule and reign, and we can see in hindsight that that was another satanic attempt to get rid of the line of David so that the promise that the Messiah would one day come from the line of David would not be possible. So all through the history of man since the time of Abraham, we can see at various times and various generations how satanic attempts to do away with God's prophecy uh, was thwarted by God. And that was one particular time when she had all the descendants, she thought, put to death. But there was a priest named Jehoiada, and he helped guard this young son of a descendant of the king of southern Judah. His name was Joash. And at the time, he was seven or eight years old. They had a big procession and made him to be the king. And Jehoiada, the priest, kind of watched over him and made sure that he was kept safe and Athaliah was put to death and so forth. So Joash has become the king in southern Judah. And we read that as long as Jehoiada lived, then he made Joash made right decisions. So we can see that Jehoiada was not only a protector, but he was a good mentor over King Joash. So then we read the second day of this week, the three chapters in the book of Joel. And he was the first of the writing prophets. You may recall when we began in this month's reading, in the month of uh, June, that we started off reading from the Old Testament minor prophet book of Obadiah. And it dawned on me that we were getting ready to read through several different uh, portions of prophetic books, minor prophet books in the Old Testament, as well as major prophet books, and so it, in the reading material that I put out, the first couple of pages in this month's reading, I put a page like this. This shows the major prophets and then the minor prophets as we would see them presented in a regular Bible. If we just started from left and go to the right, 
in a regular Bible, this is the order in which we would come to those books. And then I thought that it would be good if we saw, because they were not all sent to the same place. And so I put this particular page in the front of the reading material that shows uh, whether the, the prophets were before the exile or during the exile or after the exile. And that exile refers to the exile of southern Judah uh, to the Babylonians. And so then down in this portion, and I got this information from the notes from the MacArthur Study Bible. So we're getting a little bit of the best of two things, so to speak. Uh, the presentation of the scriptures chronologically from the Greek chronological Bible and information like this that comes from a MacArthur Study Bible. And those were uh, in the beginning of this month's reading. And this particular one shows the uh, prophet, the approximate dates of their ministry and who their audience was, where uh, many of them were for Southern Judah we had a couple uh, that we see or for northern Israel, and we'll discuss that as in our time this morning. And then we have some that were sent to other places, like uh, Jonah was sent to Nineveh. And so we read these chapters about Jonah. And uh, we, Jonah was quite a story, wasn't it? Uh, he was told to go to Nineveh, which would be north and east of where he lived in the Galilean area of Israel. And instead of doing that, uh, he went uh, south and west. <laughs> he bought a ticket to go to Tarshish. But remember that there was a great storm and we won't go into all of the story, but he was thrown into the sea and God calmed the sea. And then uh, Jonah got to take a water taxi in the form of a huge fish that swallowed him whole and took him back and God spoke to the fish and he spit him out on the, the shores of Israel there. And so uh, God got his attention and he followed after God's instruction and he went to Nineveh. And that was a capital city of Assyria. That's the, the group of people, the Assyrians, that will eventually, I think week after next or two weeks after next, will read where northern Israel goes into captivity to them. And so we read about his story going through the city of Nineveh for three days. It was such a huge city and preaching judgment. And he wanted judgment to fall upon them. He didn't want God's mercy upon them. And after he got through with his trip through the city, went out on the side of the, of the hill there and, and uh, pitched a tent, so to speak, to wait and see what would happen. Well, we remember that he got disgusted uh, and down in the dumps because God didn't bring judgment. It's as if God, through the power of his spirit, working in the hearts of all those people, brought a tremendous turnaround or uh, repentance of heart and spirit of those people. And from the, the, the least of the beggars of the city to the king, they all sat in sackcloth and ashes and repented. And God spared that city for another hundred years. We'll eventually come to a minor prophet whose name is Nahum. And he will speak about the actual demise of Nineveh. And that will come about. But from the book of Jonah... I'm sorry, from the book of Joel. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Uh, we'll we read about Jonah a little bit later. But from this three-chapter book of Joel, we read who was the first of the writing prophets. He read it, or wrote about the day of the Lord. And uh, as much or more so as any of the other Old Testament writers. And the day of the Lord, we will understand, is not one day on a calendar. It refers to a period of time. And normally, in our day and time, we would picture that to be referring to Daniel's 70th week or that seven year period that we refer to as the tribulation period. And he spoke about that. And one of the important portions of this book of Joel and from chapter two of Joel was the portion that Peter read from and quoted from in his sermon on the day of Pentecost that we'll get to over in the New Testament. And there was also a portion there uh, we'll we'll talk about as we get there. So then, referring back now to southern Judah in the next day of our reading this week, we discovered that Jehoiada, the priest, who was the protector and the mentor for young King Joash, died. And that then became the downward spiral beginning of Joash because he began to listen to counsel from bad people 
in southern Judah. And uh, God allowed the, the uh, spirit of God to come upon Jehoiada's son by the name of Zechariah. And he spoke pretty bluntly and abrasively to young King Joash and warned him. And Joash had Zechariah put to death. He was stoned in the courtyard area between the altar and the temple. And so that was another kind of domino that fell in the downward spiral of this young King Joash. And the Syrians then came against uh, southern Judah and God allowed the Syrians to uh, bring about some chastisement on southern Judah because of the wickedness of uh, the change and the heart attitude and the act actions of young Joash. And uh, so Jehoiada had died and they made Amaziah to become king over Judah. And in northern Israel, Jehoiah has died and he had a son named Joash and became king. So we're in that area that of reading this week where the kings from both northern Israel and southern Judah have similar or the same names, but they're different people. Then we read about in northern Israel that uh, in the middle of the week that Elisha, that prophet who followed after Elijah, had become sick and he's going to die. And he did die. And uh, prior to his death, Joash, the king of northern Israel, came to see him and wept over him. And Elisha told him to take an arrow and shoot it out the window and then take the remaining arrows from the quiver and strike them on the ground. And that was a representation of how he was going to give prophecy of northern Israel being able to defend themselves against the armies of northern Syria. And so we read that he did shoot the arrow and then he took the arrows in the quiver and struck the ground three times. And Elisha was uh, angry with him that he didn't strike the ground more than that because he said that each of those times you struck the ground will represent uh, battles that you'll have against northern Syria. And had you struck the ground several times or many times, you maybe would have destroyed them. But as it is, you will only be able to beat them in battle on three occasions. And so uh, he was distraught over that and sad for northern Israel because Elisha, as well as Elijah, had been sent as prophets. They were non-writing prophets to northern Israel. And so he died. And then we read that uh, an interesting thing that took place. Remember that one of the requests that Elisha had made from Elijah before Elijah was caught up to heaven without dying in the fiery chariot and the whirlwind was that he might have a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So if you have our reading material in the right-hand margin whenever there would be something that Elisha did or said that was miraculous, I tried to number them to see if he indeed did twice as many miracles things as uh, Elijah did. And so we came to the last one in this week's reading where he had died, had been put into his uh, body and bones put into a tomb. And years later, uh, when there were some people that were in the process of burying a man who had died, as they were in the process to do that, they saw a band of the enemies coming. And so they had to hide. And so they just threw this man's uh, body into a tomb. And it happened to be the tomb where Elisha was, had been buried. And when this dead man's body hit the bones of Elisha, he was raised back to life and he stood up and I suppose walked out of the tomb. And I think that was a miracle number 24 that I had enumerated. So then back down in southern Judah, Amaziah began a reign and he reigned for 29 years, we read. And the scripture said that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. And I'm not completely sure that I understand all of what that meant, but we see that a good portion of the kings in southern Judah were also described as being bad. This particular one, he said, was a good king, although the didn't have the right motivation, apparently. And uh, he was going to hire the Israelites to help him fight against Edom. And God's instruction through a man came to him not to do that. And so he obeyed that. 
and God allowed them to have the victory over their Edomite enemies at that particular time. And uh, then we read about the people took Azariah and made him king instead of Amaziah. Azariah is also the man that we read about whose name was Uzziah. And we'll read about him more next week in next week's reading. But Am uh, Uzziah was 16 or Azariah was 16 when they made him king and he reigned for 52 years in southern Judah. And we read that as long as he sought the Lord, the God that God made him to prosper. But there will become a time when he kind of gets full of himself that we'll read about next week. And uh, God will then uh, bring about judgment or chastisement upon him also. Back up in northern Israel, we read that Jehoahaz died or Joash died. And there was a man named Jeroboam that we now will read as Jeroboam II became the king. And so he was the third of those four generations from Jehu that became king over northern Israel. And first off, uh, there was uh, uh, Jehoash and uh, I'm losing my notes here, but he Jeroboam II was the third of these four uh, generations of kings after Jehu who became a king over northern Israel. Then we see that Rhys interjected here a few verses from Amos chapter 9. Amos was a man from southern Judah who was not a priest and uh, certainly not of the royal line. He was a sheep herder and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. But God put his hand on him and chose him, put his spirit upon him, and told him to go to northern Israel to prophesy against those people. So we read some of these verses and we'll read more from Amos next week. But we also will discover that part of the verses that we read about Amos or from the book of Amos this week will be quoted by the half-brother of Jesus in the book of Acts, James, at that uh, Jerusalem council that we'll read about in Acts chapter 15. We'll quote a couple of verses that come from the portion of Amos chapter 9 that Reese put in here. And one of the reasons that I like the Reese Chronological Bible is because in his presentation of the chronology of the scriptures, he doesn't just do a whole book or a whole chapter at a time. He will take, if he thinks it's fitting for the chronology of the, the passages, he'll take one verse from somewhere and put it uh, wherever he thinks that it is applicable. And that's what he did with these four or five verses from the ninth chapter of Amos in our reading this week. He talked about a future restoration when uh, uh, a future restoral of Israel was prophesied. And in northern Israel, we started reading from the book of Hosea. Hosea was that prophet that was sent to northern Israel. Hosea was and Amos was. And Hosea is the one that we will read about, will be used by God as an object lesson to northern Israel because he was told to marry a woman of harlotry. And his harlotry wife and family dysfunction and heartaches will serve as an object lesson that will represent the heartache that God has over the northern kingdom of Israel. And as uh, Hosea's wife was unfaithful to him, that would be symbolic of the northern Israel people being unfaithful to Jehovah God and following after idols. And so the spiritual idolatry was compared to physical harlotry and infidelity in scripture. And he serves as an object lesson. And so then we come to this story about Jonah. And uh, we read uh, from his book. And this is when we read that he was told to go to Nineveh and he went the opposite direction. And God redirected him and he brought him back and he went through the city and, and uh, preached coming judgment. And then he went out and sat on the side of the hill and waited to see what would happen. And one of the things that I commented, if you have our reading material, that it's easy to get hung up in the props of the story or the play of Jonah rather than the 
main theme or the spiritual takeaway from the book of Jonah. And so we get caught up in the huge fish and the storm on the sea and Jonah's being swallowed by the fish and then the, uh, the gourd plant that comes up and provides uh, shade for Jonah in the heat of the day and then how he gets upset when God allowed for a, a cut worm to come along and destroy the gourd and he lost his shade and all of that and he wanted to just have God take his life and the theme of that book is that God's mercy is long-suffering and he's a compassionate and loving God that desires to show mercy to people that will repent and turn from their ways and turn their hearts towards him. And that's what the people in Nineveh did. Remember, Nineveh was that capital city of Assyria. And so they repented and God spared the city for another hundred years. And so that was the main theme of the book of Jonah. And we'll see more about Jonah when we get into the New Testament because Jonah will be used by Jesus as an object lesson to a group of unbelieving religious leaders that are seeking after a sign to prove that Jesus is who he said he was. And he'll bring up uh, Jonah as the only sign that they will be given. So at the end of our week reading, we talked about Northern or read about Northern Israel and we read from Amos chapters one and two, Amos and Hosea and Isaiah were prophets that uh, were also writing prophets and we see that they were somewhat contemporary with one another. And we see that Amos said that his ministry was during the days of Uzziah that also had the name of Azariah. You can tell by the clocks I've gone beyond what I intended. <laughs> and, uh, but we're just about done. So Amos uh, had his ministry begin during the days of, U of Uzziah, king of Judah. And he was called from being a sheep herder and a uh, gather a sycamore fruit to go north to uh, teach and to preach and to minister and to give warning of God's coming judgment on northern Israel. But we, we see that he used some pretty good psychology. When he got there, he began getting a crowd together and talking to them about the judgment of God that would come upon their enemies, the various enemy nations that were around northern Israel. And we could almost envision that as he was going on and talking about this judgment that would come upon northern Israel's enemies, they may have even been clapping their hands or saying amen from the crowd or whatever. And then as we read the end of our reading this week, uh, he even talked about the judgment that God was going to bring about on southern Judah. And so once again, they would have liked what they were hearing from this man that had come to them from southern Judah. But in tomorrow's reading, at the beginning of next week's reading, we're going to see that all of a sudden, now that he has their attention, he's going to then begin to deliver to them the real meat of the letter or the book, so to speak, that God sent him there for. He's going to turn his focus upon them and will begin to tell them about the judgment that God's going to bring them upon them in northern Israel. And they're not going to like that. And they'll basically tell him to shut up and go home. But that's for reading for next week. Father, thank you for the time that you give us to read and study your word. Thank you for those who join us online. Help us, Father, that as we read through your word, even from the Old Testament, that we will be encouraged to recognize the spiritual principles and applications that you would have us to recognize and to make application of our own lives in our day and time. How that repentance is a good thing and that you as a loving heavenly father and a ben benevolent king of all the universe and the creator of the universe desire to show your mercy and your compassion on people who will turn from their wicked ways and turn to you. So we ask that you would help us that we might always have a tender heart ready to confess our failures and to turn from our ways and repent and to turn our hearts towards you. Thank you for the blessings of what we've read this week. We ask for your blessings on those who are reading along with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Hope that you have a great Lord's Day tomorrow and enjoy visiting and fellowshipping with fellow believers. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, Lord bless you.